So just good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone who has joined us. Uh, I believe there's um, over 100 people already in the platform. So welcome to our webinar. We'll just give a few, uh, one more minute for people to, to, to call in uh, and, and then we will get started. I think we can begin now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, warm greetings to everyone. I am Norman Ramirez, Program Officer of the Ramsar Regional Center East Asia, and I will be your moderator for this event. The United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP, Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, Ramsar Regional Center East Asia, and Wetlands International are pleased to welcome you to the global webinar on wetlands and disaster risk reduction. The organizers have invited four wetland experts who will remind us about the importance of wetlands and climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Before we begin, I would like to make a few uh, short announcements. Please be reminded that the webinar is being recorded. We would also like to acknowledge the support provided by the, by the European Union in developing the ECODRR guidebook. And we encourage you to accomplish the pre and post survey as requirements to receive a certificate of participation. The certificates will be sent through your respective email addresses. So to formally start the webinar, we'd like to invite Ms. Marisol Australia, the RR Program Manager of UNEP, to deliver the opening remarks. Again, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, and good afternoon to all of those who have joined us uh, from around the world. Um, I'm calling in from uh, our office based in Geneva, uh, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here and join you uh, at this webinar uh, because I have a, actually a personal um, a personal stake in this in this effort um, to talk about wetlands and disaster risk reduction, um, and and in also highlighting through the guidebook that we will be launching later today. Um, on, on wetlands and disaster risk reduction, which in a way we started discussing this together with partners, um, including Wetlands International and Ramsar um, Convention and the Ramsar Regional East Asia office at the Ramsar COP in 2015 in Uruguay. Um, and when we were um, supporting the resolution to be adopted on wetlands and disaster risk reduction, we said that we would work together in developing um, guidelines and in raising awareness um, on wetlands and disaster risk reduction. So I think now I, we can start to see the, the fruits of this um, you know, hard labor and, and investment and commitment from partners in bringing this work um, to fruition. So I'm very happy to, to be here with you. Um, as we know, you know, linking wetlands and disaster risk reduction may not be new, but as we face the increasing climate emergency, we are, in, we are seeing an increase in disasters and climate-related events um, globally, which is really causing unprecedented human and economic losses. And recurring disasters um, we, we see each year now and, and loss and damage uh, as a result of disaster and climatic events um, are are increasing and increasing vulnerabilities of our local of local communities um, and, and our global society. So we have seen recurring disasters um, from tropical cyclones in the Pacific, unprecedented summer uh, wildfires, um, summer wildfires in Europe, and flooding in South Asia this year are just a few examples. And the impacts of these disasters we know are exacerbated by climate change but also by ecosystem degradation, by wetland degradation, linked to human activities and unsustainable land and water use. So it is really very important to raise the awareness that we have on, on wetlands and why they are important for disaster risk reduction. We know that healthy and sustainably managed wetlands can contribute to mitigating some of these hydroclimatic hazards and disaster events and, and help to strengthen resilience of communities in coping with these um, extreme events. 
So it is really important that maintaining healthy wetlands is an important step to reducing uh, disaster and climate risks, which we also refer to as the EcoDRR approach. So wetlands provide, as we know, multiple services and benefits, and, and some of these include um, collecting and holding water during floods, for example, and re releasing it gradually, um, and regulating water flows to, to um, ensure consistent water supply, thus mitigating the impacts of droughts. Um, in Sri Lanka, for example, we have seen that the city of Colombo has now um, put in place proper management of wetlands in the city as a key component of their city's flood prevention plan, uh, which we see is a really clear indication of that governments and, and countries are now seeing this as a viable solution for risk reduction. So although wetlands still cover a global area of 1.2 billion hectares, which is larger than the country of Canada, they are also declining fast, um, with 35% losses already um, being, being, being measured since 1970. So it is really um, my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar that continues to raise awareness about the role of wetlands in disaster risk reduction, in climate change adaptation, and in contributing towards strengthening resilience to, to both disasters and, and climate change impacts. Um, I would like to welcome our speakers um, today who will, who will speak about this topic. They will be highlighting the importance of wetlands in, in, in climate change adaptation, in disaster risk reduction, by showcasing different examples from around the world. Um, specifically with a focus on Asia, the Asia Pacific region in particular, um, and looking at how wetland conservation and restoration is being used um, at the country and community level in, in addressing the disaster and climate uh, emergencies. And finally, in this webinar, we will also um, have the pleasure to, to, it, to introduce to you and, and launch uh, our guidelines, the guidance note that that partners have developed on wetlands and disaster risk reduction, which is a guide a guidebook specifically designed for wetland site managers um, and, and for them to be able to apply the principles of EcoDRR and ecosystem-based approaches in wetland management for disaster risk reduction. Uh, so it is my pleasure once again to, to welcome our panel, our rich panel of, of experts, uh, Professor Max Finlayson from Charles Stewart University from Australia, Dr. Anadel Kabanban from Wetlands International based in the Philippines, um, and Dr. Ritesh Kumar uh, from Wetlands International in India, who will be delivering his remarks through video, um, and Dr. Misaka Heterachi uh, from James Cook University in Australia, who has also been um, leading our efforts in helping us consolidate knowledge and practice through this guidebook. Um, so this is, in one sense, also our way of um, you know, taking this big step towards how we can scale up implementation uh, towards really enhancing the role of wetlands, wetlands conservation and restoration for disaster risk reduction. Because if you think about it, um, you know, if we, you know, measure, like look at and map all of the Ramsar sites around the world, we have over 2,400 Ramsar sites around the world, covering 2.5 million square kilometers alone, just the Ramsar sites. And if we can start there, even um, at the site level, in introducing disaster risk reduction um, approaches in our in wetlands management, we can go a long way in, in demonstrating, in showcasing um, some of the knowledge and practice that we have in the wetlands community um, in, in, in helping us and able to, to build resilience against climate and disaster risks. So once again, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to be here with all of you. Um, I would like to, to say thank you to specifically to the main partners who have been involved in this collective endeavor, including the Ramsar Regional Center of East Asia, the Ramsar Convention Secretariat, of course, um, Wetlands International, 
uh, and also, of course, the UN, UN Environment Pro Program team, who has been part of this uh, collaborative effort. So with that, I think I will hand over to Norman um, to continue our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your message, uh, Ms. Australia. We appreciate the support provided by UNEP. Now we would like to invite uh, Dr. Max Finlayson, as mentioned uh, earlier, professor of Charles Sturt University of Australia, to talk about wetlands and DRR, in particular about wetland green infrastructure or nature-based solutions that can help reduce the risk and consequences of natural hazards. Dr. Finlayson, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Are you there, Professor Max? <clears throat> Okay, good. Oh, <clears throat> your audio, please. Uh, yeah, can you can try again? Can I hear you? Now it's gone green. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you to, um, this evening in my time about this uh, incredibly important topic. Wetlands are important and disaster risk uh, reduction is important and here we are bringing them together. So I want to make some, uh, some general comments, some introductory comments that will lead to what the other speakers are talking about to help raise this issue. So can we go to the next slide please? So around the world, natural disasters continue to have a severe impact on people, their livelihoods and their environment. This is a very broad statement, but I think there is increasing evidence that it is true. Over 90% by some estimates of natural disasters are caused by water related hazards, such as floods, droughts and storm surges. I say by some estimates because people actually measure things and start from different points. We're not arguing about the data though. Climate change is unfortunately increasing the frequency of the extreme weather, which causes many of these hazards which relate to these disasters. So wetlands, as a consequence of this, can under uh, specific circumstances reduce the impacts of natural disasters and support recovery efforts. Both of these aspects, I think, are important. Reducing the natural disasters or the, ha the hazard and supporting recovery. Next slide. So just a, a general introduction here. Climate change we consider is driving a worldwide increase in um, extreme events which lead to disasters. There's a lot of modelling, a lot of analysis uh, which is showing that the number of disasters, natural disasters is increasing and we can, and can expect this to increase in this case on, on this graph from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction to expecting about 560, 560 disasters by the year 2030. Reducing emissions in relation to climate change is a priority, but even under the best case scenarios, we will face compounding effects from these disasters on our biodiversity, our livelihoods and ourselves. So next slide. So let's just quickly climate change. Extreme weather events are increasing in intensity and frequency in many parts of the world, not all parts, but in many parts. Climate change and the complexity of disasters is creating deep uncertainty. Uncertainty in people's livelihoods, how we invest, how we live our lives and how we manage and how we respond. More complex disasters are occurring, influenced by a confluence of multiple causes. Now, there was all the other factors, the environmental degradation, the livelihood issues, the political issues which we face are actually compounding the um, outcomes of climate change and disasters. In it is therefore increasingly difficult to determine which areas should prepare for what kind of disaster. We know in many cases, some areas are more vulnerable, but do we understand it fully? I don't think we do, but there is an increasing effort to try and understand this. Next slide. 
So, so this just leads to, and I re, uh, refer to uh, Prinsley 2022, who published a uh, short article, really raising the issue, it is a time for transformational solutions, not just to continue as we're doing, but to take a major step, large steps forward. And traditional solutions to disasters work to a certain extent, but they're not working fully. We need to expect the worst and to find new solutions. That is in terms of a planning process, planning for the worst uh, situation, so we can actually manage and hopefully get it right in as many, in as many cases as we can. We'll not get it right in all cases, unfortunately. There's a lot of work to be done before some of the solutions that are being looked at are ready for broad scale uh, adoption. Large uh, collaborative research missions or efforts are still needed to deliver large scale solutions to avert, to avert the impacts of intensifying extreme events. We need research, we need to move from research to management, both are important. And management is outcomes and benefits of people and nature. There is a lot of inertia in current approaches to disasters. We need to recognize the scale of the threat and develop, this gets back to the heading on this slide, transformational solutions. Solutions that really make a change, not incremental, but a major step forward. So with this in mind, can we apply this thinking to wetlands? Are we doing it already? I think you'll hear in the presentations after mine that there is a lot of effort, a lot of huge important steps, but what else is needed? We have something going on, we need more. What is that? Next slide. So the role of wetlands in mitigating disasters or reducing uh, disaster risk. Wetlands can be seen as natural water infrastructure, which can help to mitigate the physical impacts of hazards. The services which healthy wetlands provide, including food and clean water, can mitigate the humanitarian impacts of disasters, that is helping to enhance the immediate coping capacity of communities and their sustainable long-term recovery. That is, we're looking at how we cope with the disaster, the impact, and then how we recover. Both parts are, in, are important and wetlands can contribute to both. Therefore, to summarise this, wetlands can help mitigate natural disasters in two broad ways. One is to reduce the immediate physical impacts. This is important, I think we understand why. And two is to help people survive and recover in the aftermath of the disaster. Next slide. I want to go through some, some of the examples and just give, give some cases as to illustrate the role of wetlands in disaster risk uh, reduction and managing the outcomes. The role, let's look at start with wetlands for flood protection. The role of wetlands in flooding varies depending on the location of the catchment, the antecedent uh, conditions, the amount of rainfall, the distribution and intensity and biophysical ca characteristics of the catchment. That is, we understand wetlands have these, they have this ability to mitigate flooding, but it, it's variable across the landscapes. It's not the same in all places, depending on the conditions. In many cases, floodplains provide space for flood water, thereby, thereby reducing downstream flood peaks and attenuating flows. This we understand that the floodplain is part of the river. We take away the floodplain, we put, push the water back into the river. All the water comes out on the high flows and creates a disaster. So looking at how we manage our floodplains is important as managing the river and the water itself. And in some cases, headwater wetlands are runoff generating areas and increase flood peaks and flows. So therefore, it depends on where you are on the river system as to how you'll be affected by changes in the flows. In, in, the, in the downstream parts, if you have the floodplains intact, if you have the holes and the space, you can attend, you can uh, mitigate some, some of the effects of flooding. If you're in the upper reaches and you're in the faster flowing things, you may actually be in the danger zone. So it's not the same impacts across the entire river. We need to keep that in mind. But not one solution, not one magic um, uh, silver bullet for the whole river system. But in places, it can be very, very helpful in how we manage uh, or how we manage wetlands to manage disaster risk. Next slide. 
So this is, leads to managing the rivers. It's really about making space for the river. Flooding is a huge uh, disaster. It's a common in many parts of the world. We've seen some massive examples in the last 12 months, for example, uh, the case in Pakistan for recently, where there's a huge amount of rainfall. We had a large, in some cases, I believe, we had four, five, or even more times the amount of annual rainfall, monthly rainfall. We had the annual rainfall or multiples of the annual rainfall in one month. How can any landscape cope with such changes? So we need to understand the disasters as well as to understand the uh, landscape. And in some cases, the rainfall may just be too much. That gives us a major problem, but, but we can make space for the water on the floodplains, which is making space for the river. Instead of ever increasing the height of dikes, remove them and reconnect floodplains to the rivers. Instead of channelizing, give space. It's really a form of improved spatial planning and a return to more natural river systems. It's an important point to more natural river systems, not necessarily a totally natural system because of the changes that are in place. In the Netherlands, a lot of money, billions of dollars, has been used to manage water in a different way. After a long time, possibly centuries, they have moved to try to make space for the rivers. It's not just a technical innovation to get these um, changes through. We need the science. We need to understand the engineering. We need to understand the hydraulics, the hydrology, etc. But we also need new legislation, new forms of inter-organisation inter collaboration, new forms of private uh, public, public, public coordination and new forms of governance. So we need the governance structure, the human element, while we look at the science and the physical element. Next slide. But we can make space for rivers. An example from the United Kingdom, floodplain restoration can be a valuable part of catchment's flood management strategy as shown in this example. For the restored floodplain, this is in this shown in the table here, the central line in the table, has reduced flows compared to embanked conditions. That is, we actually have, have examples in various parts of the world where we've shown this works. It's can we then implement this in other places you know, is a major challenge. Some places, unfortunately, because of human infrastructure, human um, settlement, farming lands, et cetera, it may be limited. But where we can, we should be looking uh, to try and do this. Next slide. Colombo in Sri Lanka. Colombo is a, is a city built around wetlands. The Colombo wetland complex is what it's now termed. The hydrological catchments is large. Wetlands cover a lot of this area, but it were declining for many years due to landfill and waste disposal. We weren't valuing the wetlands in Colombo. This was reducing so to reduce urban flooding, we need to store the water in the floodplains. In this case, if we manage the wetlands in um, um, Colombo in an effective way, you can store almost 40% of floodwaters. That's a lot, particularly when you look at the population density and the settlement patterns in a city like Colombo. It can use help a lot of people. In this case, 230,000 people estimated would get better protection from floods if the wetlands are managed in this way. There is a lot of effort to try and do this now. And it can stop some of the um, loss in economic output, et cetera, reduce the damage to the economy at the same time. So we're relating people, disasters, environment, and protection and economy. It's all coming together if we start looking at it in the same way. Next slide. Let's move from floods to the other extreme, which is drought mitigation. F rivers, uh, wetlands can maintain the flow during dry season and droughts they can summer the flow. Not compared to a flood, but there can still be water in these systems. Many wetlands uh, are perceived to act as sponges, filling in the, they fill up in the wet season and release water slowly in the dry season. Many wetlands are perceived to recharge groundwater, which is another extension of the water cycle, obviously. But in many cases, we don't have good data. We think this is occurring. We, in some cases, we'd like to think it is occurring, but when we measure it, it may not be occurring or it's more subtle than how we understand it. So the key point in this as well 
while we uh, perceive these, we think we understand the benefits, we need to be able to measure them so we can plan better to ensure we get the benefits. Because if we don't get it right, there could be a bigger disaster. We could make the risk worse. So I make a plug here for continuing the science, continuing the monitoring and the assessment to ensure we understand what is happening in individual cases. So it may not be the case in all cases, in every instance. It may, it could be more complex. Individual cases need to be considered. The next slide gives us an example where our understanding as we undertook more research of this example in South Africa, the perception was the wetland, this is a small wetland only in a small valley, the wetland was the source of very important dry season river flow. And therefore, people wanted to maintain the wetland to uh, improve the wetland to get the water flow in the dry season. The reality, when we got more measurements over some years, the wetland itself contributed little to the dry season river flow. The flow downstream of the wetland was maintained by the groundwater from the undisturbed upper catchment. This raises a lot of issues about understanding the entire system to get the benefits. The benefits were there. Understanding how they were, how we were getting them wasn't in initially fully understood, it was later understood. This will give better guidance for management. So getting the benefits is valuable. Understanding it so we continue to manage to maintain the benefits is critical. Next slide. Now let's move to the coast. Coastal protection, wetlands uh, around the coast, many parts of it have been degraded. We've lost a lot of wetlands. We've changed the form of a lot of wetlands in the coastal areas. We understand that they're important for coastline protection. Coastal protection is critical. Wetlands are part of it. But we have seen, and these slides just give some of the examples of the changes, uh, urban development in mangrove areas. So the two slides on the left, so a mangrove area and a nearby area where urban expansion has occurred. Expanded out right to the edge of the wetlands. Another case in the salt marsh system, we have industrial and port development. Huge amounts of concrete are going in to replace the wetlands, replacing the mud and the plants and the water with concrete infrastructure. The third one on the right hand side, just another example, in estuaries and deltas, a lot of our human populations, our human activities are concentrated in estuaries and deltas. And again, we're converting these into ports, infrastructure, and urban development. Next slide. If we're looking at that, if we're changing our um, coastal systems so much, how we, uh, I mean, I think we can say we have reduced the uh, potential of wetlands to protect from disasters. Therefore, we've, we've increased the risk of disaster. How much and in what areas we can refine this? I think here we need to look at, um, come back to the science, etc. again. This is just an example here of the role of, wet, of mangroves in coastal risk reduction. If we start here and look at the waves, hundreds of meters are needed, of mangroves are needed to significantly reduce waves. This is relation to the wave height and the topography of the area, which is all related. So not all mangroves are equal in terms of disaster risk and reduction. But we understand through the hydraulic analyses, et cetera, understanding the ecology and the physics of the water movement, basically, uh, we can work out what we need or how much uh, protection or risk reduction we get from certain mangroves. Just to be, I want to repeat again, not all mangroves are the same. You have some that are one species, very low things to other mangroves, which have a lot of species, 30 or 40 species in some cases of mangrove trees, and they can be 20 or 30 meters high with different root structures, etc. This affects the impact on um, storm and surge protections, which I'll show in the next slide. If we look at storm protection, again, hundreds of meters may be needed. So 10 meters is not enough. A very narrow fringe won't do it. We can maintain or restore the, the larger extent of mangroves, then we can get some uh, risk reduction. Thousands of meters may be needed to reduce flooding impact from larger storm surges, etc. 
So again, it's the relationship of the mangrove structure, the mangrove height, and the width of the mangroves to the events we have to face. Now, um, tsunamis, these are huge waves, hundreds of metres needed to reduce tsunami flood depths by five to 30%. It's not, it's a um, significant amount, but it's not 100%, nowhere near it. Mangroves do not provide a secure defence against many tsunamis, against the bigger tsunamis. And on the other side, nor do many engineering uh, defences. I want to come back to this point at the end. How do we, can we merge engineering infrastructure with natural infrastructure to try and increase the, uh, um, improve the risk reduction and increase the defences? And noting that this will vary, that we have a lot of science on this. I think while we're making these decisions about how to uh, manage coastal systems and reduce the risk reduction, I'd really like to encourage uh, transparent application of the science, not just general statements. Understand it, make sure we can protect the people, the biodiversity, the benefits we get through these actions. We come to, on the far right of this um, table, um, sea level rise. Sea level rise is, we tend to think of it as a slow incremental increase. Mangroves will move if they can, if there is space. And, and the right soil conditions, they will move with the uh, tides if the timing is right. In many cases, sea level rise may be too fast. Mangroves can also colonise areas very fast and we can plant mangroves in some cases uh, successfully. But the mangroves may then move into the salt marshes. So you could end up replacing one type of wetland with another. Is that what we want? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I say we need to be aware that with things like sea level rise and mangroves and salt marshes, we could be changing the distribution. We need to understand that and the benefits and the values that change with that. Not just assume is a single solution, a single formula for all outcomes. There are benefits, not the same in all cases. Next slide. Sorry, we seem to have lost the slide. Yeah, I was there. Do we just yeah. go down through the slide pack again? Yes, this one. You bring this one up on the full screen. This one, yes. So this is just um, starting on the right hand side, getting near the end of this presentation. Mangroves reduce damage from large storms. This is because there's the physical structure. If the and if the it's a combination of the height of the mangroves, the density of the mangroves, and the type of root structures, and the width of the mangroves. We need to understand all those elements to get the best outcomes for this. Mangroves can reduce um, wave damage, etc. And this is again due to the complex, the, the structure of the mangroves. Not all mangroves are the same. We understand the mangroves and the, the variation and or the variability within the mangroves, we'll see whether the water from a wave surge will move straight through or will be mitigated in the process. We get to the um, tsunami one, and this is the one I really wanted to show. If a really large tsunami is almost impossible to stop, therefore we need to be aware that some events may be bigger than the protection we can offer through these natural processes or human engineered process, uh, mechanisms as well. So we can get a lot of benefits from these um, coastal defense systems through mangroves in particular. We need to be aware of the limits. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it at all. We should be encouraging the restoration and maintenance of mangroves. In terms of um, disaster risk reduction, understand the ability of any particular ma uh, mangrove system to mitigate certain types of events. Next slide. So the importance of social capital to post-disaster recovery is widely recognised, but there is much less recognition of the role of environmental capital. This is in relation to wetlands helping to cope with the aftermath of natural disasters. What happens after? We understand how people are important, how economics are important. What about the environment? When roads and communication net networks are disrupted and government services are overstretched, wetlands can still provide 
some wetlands can still provide food, water and building materials. Again, not all, but in many cases, these basic uh, materials can be there. You need to be aware of the health implications and access issues, etc. But there is a recognised benefit of having clean water and food from mangroves. Long-term recovery is also assisted by healthy ecosystems. We mentioned this was mentioned right at the start. How healthy environments, healthy ecosystems, can help us mitigate the risk of um, disasters and also help us recover. So therefore, we come back to this point again, maintaining the healthy environment. What is a healthy environment can be a complex discussion. I think for the purposes here, that statement is valid by itself. Next slide. So at times, so this is really a number of principles. Just a reminder, Professor, about the time. Yes, Just I think there's two slides. Yeah, we need you. to establish and restore, I've said this anyway, establish and restore the natural functions of rivers, floodplains, mangroves. We need to engineer a naturalistic disaster redu risk reduction responses of an emphasis on small local outcomes. Small local is important, not just big and widespread. Next. So this is the last slide. In, in cases, as I said this earlier, we may need to combine, I think we will need to combine in many cases, natural infrastructure, restoring and maintaining, in this case, coastal ecosystems, but in other systems as well, maintain them in parallel or mixed and combined with the natural engineering defences that we have. Partly because we've changed the ecosystem so much and partly that we cannot undo some of those changes. So can we get soft and hard engineering approaches to work together? This, I think if we can do this, then we are at the level of getting transformational change, where we're trying to make the best of our natural ecosystems, our restoration and management, and our ability as a species, as um, communities, to engineer for the betterment of society. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Finlayson, for highlighting the role of wetlands for DRR and setting the stage for the subsequent presentations. Uh, in the interest of time, um, we'd like to invite the participants. If you have questions for Professor Finlayson, please uh, send them through the chat chat uh, function, and um, uh, we will try our, our best to answer those also through chat. Thank you again, uh, Professor Tenison. This time we'll hear a number of EcoDRR case studies from different countries. Our next speaker, Dr. Ritesh Kumar, Director of Wetlands International uh, South Asia, has prepared a recorded video for all of you. If you have questions for Dr. Kumar, Mr. Drew Verma, Senior Technical Officer of Wetlands International South Asia, will be available to address these. So, um, Sarah, can you please share the Dr. Ritesh presentation? Good day, morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I present uh, some of our learnings from uh, integration of wetlands and disaster risk reduction uh, from the Indian cases. Uh, some of the uh, recent times, uh, it is becoming very apparent that climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of extreme events. And a major proportion of those extreme events are uh, hydrologically mediated. And secondly, it is also apparent that landscapes where wetlands are degraded are less resilient to face the extremities and thereby necessitating uh, uh, integration of uh, wetland management in disaster risk reduction measures and uh, most recently uh, 2022 we had uh, floods in bangalore which is a city uh, important for um, uh, infra uh, it and other services now, the whole uh, portion of the city which was converted to uh, develop the it hub 
was underwater. The amount of damages that happened, not just physically, but due to the linked impact on economic activities, the share prices, the number of productive days lost, calls for uh, making conscious choices on where to build what parts of landscapes uh, to build upon. And Bangalore is a classic case, uh, case in point. So uh, what we have seen is that uh, uh, unless we take a long term view on disaster risk reduction, uh, the strategies are, um, you know, not not going to work. And the classic case is that of the Mahanadi Delta. The Delta is one of the most productive parts of the landscape. Uh, this is on the east coast of India. And the Delta has evolved over a period of time uh, due to the sediment accumulation, which is highly fertile. So this uh, portion, which uh, has, uh, which accounts for it, only 8% of the state's geographic area houses nearly 20 to about 20% of the, the population. Now in the uh, times when floods were seen as uh, a major deterrent to economic activities, much of the emphasis was on controlling the fluvial regimes and especially building a mac uh, and uh, there was also an ambition by the erstwhile you know colonial rule to regulate water supply so that the water could be taxed and revenue could be generated but essentially what has happened over a period of time that a flood dependent uh, delta wherein economic activities were aligned with flood pulses has now become flood vulnerable for two reasons one that construction of embankments has impeded the natural connectivity in the uh, in the delta and secondly the delta itself is deprived of sediments which is locked up in hydraulic structures within the river channels and the delta is shrinking uh, so uh, the disaster management, the Sendai framework, when it talks of consideration of nature as a risk reduction framework, we'll have to take a holistic view. Uh, two points I would stress here. One is uh, floods are often seen as disasters in the DRR sector, but we need to understand that several ecosystems, especially wetlands, naturally are places where flooding and, and droughts happens. So we'll have to understand languages and, uh, you know, flood risk reduction should not mean that, you know, wetlands, natural hydrological regimes are altered because that would have severe consequences. The 2030 agenda integration as well calls for uh, considering uh, a more nested approach of ecosystems in, in various societal goals. So fundamentally, what we uh, request the DRR sector professionals is to see how water moves in the landscape and take a landscape view. And especially wherever water strikes the landscape, it creates a wetland or, or there is an existing natural wetland, which performs a host of functions, most of which are important for societal resilience building. For example, we all know uh, the value of mangroves in uh, storm surges and, and, and regulation and mitigation of damages from the tropical cyclones and, and floods, uh, which is so critical for several cities, Indian cities to survive. But what we should also recognize that the availability of water, availability of food, employment is so critically related to wetlands uh, so the role of wetlands should not be seen just in the context of the event, the disaster event, but in a wider spectrum of societal land, uh, you know, land use, uh, water use and climate resiliency. We have seen in the uh, in the event of 2015, um, you know, Chennai floods, wherein the uh, the Palaikarni marsh, which was the buffer for the city over a period of time, nearly one tenth of the wetland only remains. A lot of it is uh, lost due to um, industrial activity and, and conversion. The damages are no longer to the poor societies or, or to the people living in and around. In this case, much of the damages was to industrial activity, uh, which is uh, lost days of production and economic activity. Now, that is why wetlands role in disaster risk reduction should not be pitched at um, at uh, or pitched on the idea that uh, wetland dependent communities are going to be impacted. In fact, nobody is secure. The entire society is affected in, in myriad ways. When we look at Sundarbans, for example, the most important uh, contribution to society today is preventing cyclone uh, damage. 
the natural wetlands are uh, declining in India. Uh, we have lost nearly 30% of natural wetlands. We have built more uh, constructed wetlands. Now, the loss of natural wetlands should not be seen just as a biodiversity crisis, but this is where we have lost critical services uh, that these ecosystems provide to the landscapes for buffering disaster risk. So how are we operationalizing this integration? For example, in the National Disaster Management Plan, we have a section on uh, understanding risks and uh, through uh, working with uh, the government and civil society organizations that work for preparation of this we have included uh, understanding of the condition and state of wetlands um, as a part of understanding risk similarly the disaster management regulatory framework calls for preparation of uh, district disaster management plans we are promoting that in wetland conservation and wise use is included within uh, district disaster management plans and wetland restoration included within investments for risk reduction and this can actually boil down to local level cases this is one example from a village in uh, coastal orissa that we are working on how wetlands can be enmeshed between the range of activities a community does for risk reduction and you can see that uh, along a host of activities uh, including uh, building houses on a raised platform or water uh, hand pumps on a raised platform the ecosystem restoration also figures uh, as one of the measures uh, that the community intends to take for resilience building for wetland managers uh, we will have to ensure that wetland assets are conserved for example including wetlands between lands land use records and risk assessment including disaster risk assessment as a part of wetland management planning process is critical and the whole idea is to convey that uh, it is not about the individual wetlands the whole network of wetlands are critical as uh, nature's shock absorbers at the same time there is a tendency to communicate that all wetlands perform a similar function and that is what makes the uh, the disaster risk, risk reduction professionals a bit of uh, you know uh, they, they feel at a loss when they see should we consider all wetland equally or uh, this is where we as wetland scientists need to unpack and and uh, demonstrate the locational uh, you know the value of a wetland in a in in a disaster risk reduction context so that the function of a hilltop wetland or a slope wetland or a valley bottom wetlands are fundamentally different their drivers are different and these nuances need to can need to be conveyed to disaster risk reduction professionals in a meaningful way so that integration could be operationalized so i hope uh, this uh, presentation gives a glimpse of a glimpse of certain measures that we as Wetlands International South Asia are taking with the government and uh, disaster risk reduction sector uh, lead institutions such as National Disaster Management Authority and National Institute of Disaster Management on uh, operationalizing integration of wetlands within DRR sector. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Dr. Ritesh and Mr. Verma for preparing the very informative presentation, learning from the experiences from uh, South Asia. Next, we would like to invite the Director of Wetlands International Philippines, Dr. Anadel Kabanban, to deliver her presentation. Dr. Anadel, please. Good day, everyone. I would like to make a presentation on wetlands in disaster risk reduction initiatives in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Wetlands are important in disaster risk reduction, but very few are aware what wetlands are, at least in the Philippines. Few are aware of the importance of these ecosystems, especially for disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. So what are wetlands? Wetlands, wetlands are rivers, lakes, swamps, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, shallow coral reefs. These are from the inland waters coastal to the coastal waters on the shallow coral reefs. The photo here shows the Oxbow Lake in Augustan River, in the middle of the Ramsar site in Mindanao. Next slide, please. Wetlands play a role in disaster risk reduction. This has already been presented by the two speakers before me. Uh, so just to give a roundup of uh, the role of wetlands, rivers are sources of water for domestic and agricultural use. Lakes become stories of rainwater and flood water, source of water during 
flood, swamps are also the same, storage of water and storage of carbon, especially when there's peat. And mangrove forests uh, serve as sources of food, protection from storm surges, as well as seagrass that's do the same, reju reduce the strong wave action with a, with a wave with a seagrass beds, uh, blades, and the shallow carvies likewise uh, uh, reduce strong wave action and also provide food for gleaners. And very important then for uh, survival during a disaster when the food can be available of or gleaned from the environment. Next slide, please. However, despite this importance of wetlands, the wetlands, the Asia Pacific especially, are reducing its extent and status. You can see the decline in the number in the in the lines in this graph. And 50% of natural wetlands are converted to agriculture, 30% of mangroves converted to uh, socioeconomic activities, fish pond uh, culture, and uh, in Indonesia, 50% of pitlands pit are drained in for uh, or large scale uh, production of uh, palm oil. And uh, all over Southeast Asia, 80% of corvies are at risk. So uh, we, next slide please, uh, with Wetlands International has uh, come up with uh, uh, strategy over the next 10 years to 2030 uh, because uh, this uh, decline in the extent and the status of wetlands increased the insecurity of people for water, food, and climate. And you can see the, the different graphs here show the different insecurities that we experience. Next slide, please. One way we, we can address uh, the threats, uh, the risks in nature is uh, building with nature. This is one problem where we blend the wetland solution with conventional infrastructure. Sometimes people call this green-gray infrastructure. We, in the picture here, shows the permeable dam in Indonesia where the um, sediments are retained to rebuild the sediments uh, along the coastline and trap the proper gills of mangroves. And the way we approach our work is uh, three steps. We inspire by demonstrating models of good practice. We mobilize uh, stakeholders in partnerships to, to undertake actions and upscale or replicate in different landscapes or um, geographies. Next slide, please. Another problem that we are un undertaking is to have resilient cities where we integrate wetlands in urban planning and decision making for resilience building. As some of the things that were mentioned earlier is uh, the, are the things that we would like to undertake too here in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Another program is uh, safeguarding wetland carbon stores. These are basically improving the condition of peatlands and coastal wetlands to reduce the emission of, of greenhouse gases and make them not uh, emitters, rather make them net sinks of carbon. And again, we inspire, mobilize them at scale. Next slide, please. We also want to halt and reverse the declines in uh, migratory water bird population in two flyways in the Central and East Asian, Austral Asian flyways. And uh, uh, in the Philippines, there are several important uh, stops for migratory birds, such as the ones in Manila Bay. Next slide, please. In South Asia, there is uh, the plan for the conservation of Himalayan wa water towers. These are the uh, high altitude lakes in the region for food security and climate resiliency. Next slide, please. So uh, the next steps you want to undertake here in the Philippines, as well as in the other parts of uh, Asia, is to have building with nature in landscapes, seascapes, and urban areas, having resilient cities, carbon stores, 
in peatlands around the Philippines and flyway bottlenecks and the Himalayan water towers. Next slide, please. Wetlands International Philippines have initiatives in disaster risk reduction. The building with nature in the north coast of Manila Bay in Luzon, the integrated risk management in Agustan River Basin in Mindanao, and the Rich Coast Rain to Top Project, Cagayan de Oro River Basin also in Mindanao. These projects are basically uh, nature-based solutions following management frameworks. Um, and I will describe each one of this in the next few slides. Next slide, please. For uh, Manila Bay, we are employing the integrated coastal management. Next slide, please. This covers the three provinces of Bulacan, Pampanga, and uh, Bataan. This is consistent with the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. That was a strategy that developed between the governments of the Philippines and the governments of, of the Netherlands. And uh, this includes spatial planning, and restoring natural habitats, including the coastal wetlands, so that we will boost fish biomass and uh, promote environmentally friendly responses to developments. Next slide, please. In the north coast of Manila Bay, the, the coastal zone is sinking due to the over extraction of water and also sea level rise. But the uh, sinking of the coastal zone is greater than the sea level rise. And so engineers have defined a line where there is uh, supposed to be a line of defense or an area where the coastal zone has to be restored, especially in preparation for the climate change impacts, as well as the movement of the population from Metro Manila northward to this direction. Next slide, please. The hatch area here is the area for restoration of coastal wetlands. And be, beyond this uh, hatch area are the areas currently now uh, um, used by urban uh, settlements. And uh, these are ever increasing. And uh, so we need to prepare for the future so that the people living uh, behind this uh, line of defense, as they call a restoration line, will be protected in the future. Next slide, please. So what are the propositions that we um, propose to uh, protect the people and nature along the coastline? Here you can see several propositions, an inland dike from, the, from, land, from inland. This is to have an earthen dike that will protect uh, the uh, settlements in uh, Agonoy, Pambuang, and Malolos. And uh, this will um, also uh, protect uh, the flooding that will incur, the, that occurs during high tide uh, waters. This, and uh, we have uh, another zone. This is the zone where it's orange in color. This is the area that is now being used by uh, fish pond development operators, culturing fish and shrimps. And these are basically regionally fish micro areas that were converted to fish ponds. So we want to have a restoration of micro forest here, basically using the uh, associated mangrove aquaculture where the, the dike along the waterway will be strengthened with uh, mangroves or nipa, and uh, the fish pond will still be able to culture fish or invertebrates. And so it's a win win uh, situation for both the conservationists and the people, as well as the fish pond owners. Then we also propose a green belt. 100 meter green belt as much as possible connected along the coast. These are the zone here in green, and uh, uh, this will be replanted, reforested with uh, mixed species of uh, mangroves that are suitable to, to the substrate as well as to the salinity. And then we also want to restore the intertidal mudflats for the, 
bird population that migrate from Asia to Australia, stopping over to feed and uh, and having a permeable dike in blue line here to uh, re retain the sediments flowing out of the river here. And uh, to enhance the sedimentation rate of uh, the coastline and to prevent erosion, we will have to uh, break down some of the the um, dikes along the river to allow the sedimentation to flow on the, along the coastline following the uh, coastal processes. Next slide, please. The next slide will show the coastal zone without those uh, areas, so it will be a lot clearer. And we also identify areas that are currently being used by birds as major feeding grounds. These are encircled here in red. and uh, here in the mouth of the river um, in rectangular um, shape. Next slide, please. So our current projects are with this, working in the north coast of Padilla Bay uh, to reduce the risk to flooding, to provide protection to the uh, socioeconomic activities on the coastal zone and uh, to reverse some of the fish ponds that are abandoned, undeveloped, and underproductive under the to plant or not to plant project funded by the common. So, next slide, please. Another framework is integrated risk management in Augustan River Basin. This uh, river basin is at risk with erosion um, in some parts, and so we promote. Uh, uh, forest landscape restoration, basically a contour farming because there are native uh, or indigenous people uh, farming there. And we alternate the uh, crop uh, or vegetable production with rows of, uh, um, of uh, native trees and, and uh, productive trees like uh, cacao and other fruit trees. Next slide, please. And uh, over a period of time, even just from uh, two years, this uh, forest with a patch of uh, land is now covered with uh, trees, such as uh, the cacao trees and uh, other fruit trees. Next slide, please. And uh, this has uh, allowed the return of endemic species. Next slide, please. And uh, the condition of the soil and the uh, revegetation has improved. Next slide, please. The, it has provided supplemental livelihood with the intercropping of uh, high value crops. And so this lady is happy with the, the cacao that she has. Next slide, please. And along the river also, there is erosion. Um, because there's loss of vegetation. So we um, work with uh, local people to have a uh, required buffer zone. This is to have uh, grasses directly beside the, the river, alongside the river, then um, native trees, then behind this zone of the native trees, then they can have their crops, fruit trees, and vegetable pot, plots. Next slide, please. And over time, this has uh, retained the uh, riparian or the banks of the river along uh, the Agusan, and it prevented the flooding and downstream, and uh, that will cause the loss of property and lives. Next slide, please. So you can see here also another example of the riparian vegetation that was denuded in 2017 and has now some crops in 2019. Next slide, please. 
Another uh, framework is integrated river basin management. The Reach to Coast or Rain to Top project funded by the uh, RVO, the Dutch Enterprise Agency. Next slide, please. This is again another project in Mindanao where there is or was a, a big storm that caused the loss of lives and property down in the Cagayan de Oro city uh, in the Delta. And one of the reasons why, why this happened was because the watershed has been, been destroyed or has been logged. So the water that flew, flowed from the high peaks of uh, Kitanglad and Kalatungan uh, rush down to the river basin, then to the delta. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the the decision is to have uh, several actions on the ground. Um, our action as Wetlands International is to address or reduce the risk of flooding by uh, uh, demonstrating watershed rehabilitation. The, we work with a private sector that has a um, foundation and they employ the method of rainforestation. This is a, a method that employs uh, five modules and uh, which includes the work with the communities for, um, three, for about three years and then the replanting of uh, the native trees and fruit trees. Next slide, please. So the first uh, part of the or component of rainforest rainforestation is a socio-economic component. After building the uh, or, or strengthening the value system of the people, the foundation work with the community to build a community garden and also develop uh, livelihoods by having uh, plantation or of Adlai, this is a special grain that is important for diabetic uh, and thus fetches a high price in uh, in health uh, health uh, shops and also the growing of coffee in the area. This brings uh, income to the local people as well as food on their table. Next slide, please. Once the people have uh, the food on their table and money in their pockets, they're more willing and able to think of other things like a rainforestation, the second component of this um, uh, methodology is first the, the elimination of the cogon grass that grows after the logging has happened and once the this uh, the elimination of the carbon grass is using the coliandra species. This is a woody plant. Once it grows fast and shades over the carbon, it eliminates it, and then that's the then that's then the time that uh, the native trees, uh, saplings, the um, fruit trees will then be planted. Uh, by this way, the um, uh, the trees, the saplings, would have less competition with the cotton grass to grow and and tower over the cover uh, or the canopy of the uh, the caliandra. Next slide, please. We work uh, in partnership with the community. As I mentioned, we work with a community. We work with a, a private community, pr private. Uh, plantation owner, and we work also with a multi-stakeholder platform, the Kagen or River Basin, that promotes payment for ecosystem services for the um, uh, financing of of restoration in the watershed. And Wetlands International's role is to uh, to develop a hydrological model and decision support model that can be used for uh, advocacy and for convincing various stakeholders to invest on watershed, watershed restoration and reduce the risk of flooding in the river basin and in the delta. Next slide, please. 
this is a photo of the indigenous people that have gathered together to join forces with the private sector in reforesting the, the buffer zone and the gullies in the river basin of Kage and the Oro. Next slide, please. So Wetlands International's uh, role is uh, to safeguard and restore wetlands for people and nature. And I hope by these examples that I've shown here uh, shows how we work at the landscape scale, at the coastal scale or seascape scale, and work with communities to uh, restore wetlands, coastal and terrestrial wetlands, and freshwater wetlands, so that the risk to, to extreme events will be um, reduced and people will be more resilient to the extreme events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kubenban, for sharing the good practices uh, on ECODRR in the Philippines. Uh, good case studies from Manila Bay, Agusan River Basin, and Cagandia Oro River. So thank you very much. Our next speaker will explain to you the main features of the ECODRR guidebook. Please welcome Dr. Misaka Hetiarachi, adjunct associate professor of James Cook University in Australia and senior fellow under the WWF Environment and Disaster Management Program. Dr. Hetiarachi, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Norman, and um, hello to everyone joining from different parts of uh, Asia Pacific and um, all over the world. Now, the problem of being the last speaker in a forum is like everything that you are planning to say has been uh, already told by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, in this case, it makes my job a little bit easier as well. So we heard um, uh, three great presentations uh, from the Finlayson outlining the underlying phenomena and um, foundational concepts which are relevant to uh, wetlands and disaster risk reduction. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kabanban and uh, Dr. Kumar uh, demonstrating how those um, underlying phenomena and foundational concepts play out uh, in, um, in concrete uh, place-based examples. Now, uh, by this point, we, we've um, heard a lot about these foundational concepts. The, the question at hand is, how do we inter integrate, incorporate uh, disaster risk reduction into our wetland management plan. That's what I think uh, most of the participants, whether they are uh, wetland managers or environmental managers or disaster uh, related uh, professionals who are joining uh, would be interested to know at this point. Uh, can we move on uh, to the next slide? Yeah, now we all agree, as uh, highlighted by the previous speakers, uh, the disaster events are rising globally, and much of them are actually of hydrological uh, and meteorological uh, origin, um, which are floods, uh, cyclones, landslides, and so on. And uh, these um, disasters uh, are actually associated uh, with, in most cases, uh, with uh, wetlands. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so although we agree that uh, disasters are rising due to various reasons, uh, it comes to a point uh, where we should ask what is a disaster, right? because it's, it's not as simple as it may seem to be. Uh, there are many uh, definitions for the term disaster. What you can see on the top of the slide is, is, a, is a common one, but all, all these, what all these definitions would say is like uh, that a disaster 
would cause some degree of human and or environmental damage and that damage should exceed the ability of the affected uh, society uh, to cope uh, using its own resources. So all both these things should come together for a hazard or an event to become a disaster. So if you see the two photographs in the slide, they are both floods, which are normally, which is a word that uh, usually comes to our mind when we uh, hear the word disaster. They are both floods, but only one of them uh, is a disaster. The one in the right, uh, which is uh, uh, the uh, Indus floods in Pakistan uh, a few months ago, right? Uh, in the other one, which is a flooding or an inundation in the uh, the, the Kathmandu River in Senegal Delta, doesn't show any of those uh, characteristics of a disaster. No possible damage. Uh, seen or any uh, ability of the ecosystem to cope with that inundation. So uh, three important principles. No disaster is natural. Disasters don't happen naturally. Some hazards such as floods and cyclones can be natural, uh, but uh, disasters are not, right? And not only these are uh, Hazards. Some of the hazards are natural. They, in most cases, when it comes to hazards like floods, there are essential uh, processes uh, in ecosystems. Uh, let's move on. Next slide, please. Yeah. So then, if the uh, uh, disasters do not occur naturally, what creates disaster risk? So as you can see in this uh, very simple equation, there are three components to disaster risk. One, the hazards themselves, occurrence of the hazards. Hazards should occur for a disaster to happen. Hazards are, are events which can potentially ca cause social or human or environmental damage, but just with the potential. And then there is uh, there are the factors uh, how exposed the communities are to these hazards, and then how vulnerable are them are they, or how susceptible are they to the damages caused by potentially caused by these uh, hazards. Uh, so exposure, uh, while there could be uh, reasons, dynamics behind increasing hazards such as climate change, as the previous. Uh, speakers discussed. Uh, there are other factors which can actually dramatically increase the exposure and vulnerability, such as poorly planned settlements, uh, vulnerable communities, inadequate community capacity to cope with hazards, and so on, which can increase the disaster risk. Uh, we can move on. No. Next slide. Yeah, so disaster risk reduction, the magic word, DRR, is actually an integrated process to prevent new disaster risks, reduce existing risks, and manage residual risks. Uh, so it is based on the ethic of prevention rather than response. So before responding, uh, rather than responding to a disaster that has already happened, we plan to prevent uh, the disasters by reducing the risks of disasters. Uh, it, DRR looks at social environmental systems holistically, as discussed by other uh, 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 presenters uh, very clearly. And very importantly, DRR promotes full engagement of stakeholders and communities. And especially, right, the disaster risk reduction as a concept does not strive, does try to reduce risk, right? It, uh, it uh, ventures to reducing risk, but not eliminating all the hazards in a landscape. Eliminating all the hazards in a landscape uh, is not an objective of the era. We can move on. Um, so again, 
Wetlands are associated with many types of hazards. The obvious ones are the floods and cyclones, we can all imagine, but there are some less obvious ones as well. Of course, some wetland managers would know that uh, wetlands are highly susceptible and it can also, uh, some, sometimes they can cause fire hazards because wetlands uh, are not always as wet as we want them to be. In the dry season, uh, wetlands, because of their large volume of um, vegetation, uh, provides um, a lot of fuel uh, to um, uh, fires. And even it has, uh, some wetlands have very inflammable materials such as peat. So there are a myriad of um, uh, hazards associated with wetlands. Yeah, next slide. Uh, so the objective of um, using wetlands for disaster risk reduction uh, is to understand that some hazards are part of the wetland process, such as flood cyclones and so on. Uh, but wetlands have this ability of providing ecosystem services uh, which can regulate some of these hazards, right? as again discussed by the previous authors, uh, speakers. And also, ecosystem services that these wetlands provide can be disrupted uh, by some of these hazards. Right. So as you can see in this, uh, uh, in the photographs, uh, as Professor Lason uh, said, Colombo's, I'm also from Sri Lanka originally. Uh, so uh, we have like a, we have great network of wetlands in around the capital city, Colombo. And it's an integral part of the uh, wetland management uh, in Colombo. They provide, uh, they provide excellent wetland regulation service. So are the tidal wetlands of New York, which protects it from uh, the, the coastal uh, hazards. We can move on. Yeah, so what are these ecosystem services? In general, ecosystem services are benefits that are provided to human uh, communities, societies by uh, ecosystems that they live uh, adjacent to. Uh, there are four main types of uh, uh, ecosystem services, provisioning services, cultural services, uh, regulating services, and supporting services. So regulating services do, can actually uh, regulate uh, hazards such as floods and, storm and storms and so on. But then uh, if we go, next slide please. If we go on to the, if we go back to that equation of disaster risks, uh, how can these ecosystem services uh, support uh, or uh, contribute to reducing uh, disaster risks? So one is regulatory ecosystem services can regulate, uh, you know, uh, assimilate flood flow, break the energy in, in storms uh, and so on. Uh, but also the provisional ecosystem services, such as food provision, water provision, uh, they can strengthen the livelihoods, they can help uh, maintain uh, healthy communities, which reduces the vulnerability of those communities as a whole uh, to disasters. And also cultural ecosystem services or wetlands can support communities to recover from disaster trauma uh, faster. Right, by providing aesthetic services and so on, which uh, together can reduce uh, the uh, disaster risk. Uh, can you go back to just one second? Uh, yeah, no, no, the other side, next one. Yeah, uh, but again, something that we have to keep very clearly in mind is wetland ecosystem services can be affected and disrupted by disasters and climate change. Right? So they, are, they can regulate and, and provide disaster risk reduction, but also they themselves get affected by um, disasters and climate change. Next slide. Next slide, please. yeah. So uh, ecosystem-based DRR, which is a disaster risk reduction based on uh, uh, the benefits of the ecosystem services provided uh, 
by the natural systems. Uh, uh, wetlands can be used to provide ecosystem uh, based DRR or eco DRR. Uh, there are a few percepts, important percepts, uh, which uh, are applicable to using wetlands for eco DRR. This is not an exhaustive list, but some uh, important points. Uh, it's based on healthy management of uh, uh, wetlands uh, to provide optimum disaster risk reduction services. It's based on uh, strengthening wetland services that support uh, disaster resilience, as you can see. Um, and also, wetland based eco DRR uh, looks at uh, part of wetland based eco DRR is to support the wetland ecosystems to recover from disaster impacts. As I said, wetlands get impacted by uh, uh, disasters. So a uh, part of a wetland-based eco DRR uh, is to actually support uh, wetlands to recover from that. And That's finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we just a reminder for on the time, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, community uh, community engagement is an important part of uh, equitable uh, and sustainable provision of DRR. We can move on. Yeah, so there are uh, already existing Ramsar documents which uh, speaks to the disaster risk reduction using wetland uh, management. Uh, that is, as as um, that is, that is, it was mentioned, there is the Ramsar resolution uh, that, uh, uh, in two, two, 2015. Uh, there there are other uh, documents which are displayed here, which are all which have already uh, adopted. Uh, DRR into wetlands management. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are, there are other useful resources uh, as well, like the IUCN um, standard for nature-based uh, solutions, the, the WWF's uh, flat green guide, and so on. Next slide. But the the main guide, the main publication that we are talking about today. Uh, is this new guideline, the fresh guideline, on uh, 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 which is titled Wetlands and Disaster Risk Reduction uh, as a Guide for Wetland uh, Managers, which you'd be launching at the end of this uh, program. And it's primarily aimed for Ramsar wetland managers, uh, but it also provides guidance applicable to all wetlands. Uh, we can move on. Uh, as I said, uh, the Ramsar Resolution 1213 uh, already uh, acknowledges the role of wetlands in disaster risk reduction. As it says, wetlands in all parts of the world play an important role in disaster risk reduction if the wetlands are effectively managed and restored where necessary. Next slide. Uh, so the guidebook actually is based on um, the, the, the primary objective of the guidebook is to uh, give like a step by in a step by step approach uh, the um, the points or the steps that uh, uh, can be incorporated into the wetland management cycle. This is the wetland management cycle that uh, that is used in uh, followed in all the Ramsar uh, the Convention of Wetlands uh, publications, and uh, the guide uh, gives what steps can be taken at each of these stages on wetland site description, management planning, management and monitoring uh, to incorporate disaster risk reduction uh, into the wetland management cycle. Next slide. Uh, so these are the, this is actually the sequence that we follow uh, in uh, incorporating DRR into wetland management planning through this guidebook. Uh, start with the risk assessment of the hazards, vulnerability, and risks uh, in in the uh, so wet, that are associated with the wetland. Assess how the wetland can uh, cope with those uh, risks and uh, hazards and risks, uh, such as ecosystem services, ideal conditions for those, and so on. Develop uh, DRR management objectives, uh, and finally the planning actions needed. One thing that we should keep in mind is that. Uh, engaging community at all these stages. It's a cross-cutting theme. Uh, in all these stages, uh, a full engagement of the community and stakeholders is required. 
Next slide. Yeah, this is again stressing the point, no engagement, no DR. It's not just enough to share your management plans uh, with the uh, stakeholders and the communities. It's not just enough to educate them, you have to engage them uh, in, in the activities such as risk map mapping and so on, as uh, you know, described by, uh, as you know, described with examples by Dr. Kumar and uh, Dr. Kamanban. And uh, empower communities and especially discouraging communities, community wetland use will not protect the wetland, right, which is a common myth. Um, yeah, we can move on. There are two parts to the guideline. One is the introductory part, which uh, looks at these con uh, basic concept, disaster risk uh, and the environment, principles of DRR, climate change, and so on. And then we have the second part. Next slide. Which actually gives like um, step by step uh, instructions on how to incorporate uh, yeah, the DRR related actions into your management uh, plan. Uh, so it has sections like eco DRR and wetland management uh, planning, uh, so wetland management, uh, considering DRR in site description incorporating DRR into site management planning and other important points like tech SEPA planning, uh, contingency planning, and so on. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so the special features of this guide, it, it, it gives like a step-by-step -step approach to incorporating DRR into the existing planning framework uh, of the Wetland uh, Convention on Wetlands. Uh, it's, it's not, it's nothing uh, new, it doesn't bring anything from uh, outside. It's actually helping the wetland managers, whether it's the Ramsar site or a non Ramsar site, uh, to incorporate these DRR actions into their existing management planning framework. Next slide. Uh, it gives uh, sample worksheets uh, to help to organize to help the uh, wetland managers to organize this information. And also, next slide. Uh, it, uh, the, the worksheets are given, uh, are filled with a worked out example based on a hypothetical scenario so that the uh, users of the guide can actually see how those worksheets can be used in a particular context. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, yeah, that I was think, the final one. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, um, you will get the instructions on how to uh, to download the guide and um, access it with this. And I like uh, with this, I will close my uh, yeah, presentation. Back to you. Oh, thank you, Doctor uh, Mishaka. So. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation and for your contributions to uh, the EcoDRR guidebook. So for everyone, you can download the guidebook through uh, the following link that you see you can already see on the screen, or you can scan the QR code. Also, um, next slide, please. Um, so for those uh, who wish to receive a certificate of participation, Please make sure to accomplish the post survey. Um, so right after uh, the uh, this webinar. So um, now we, we we're going. We, we hope that you can stay on, and because we will would like to um, entertain a few questions. Uh, we have received a number of uh, good questions from the participants, and I would like to invite. The speakers if you want to answer any one of them for example maybe i can start with uh, one from uh, ladislas are disaster risk reduction mechanisms the same in all wetlands around the world so maybe um any of anyone can um would like to answer that
just to repeat it, uh, are disaster risk reduction mechanisms the same in all wetlands around the world? Maybe Professor Max, you would like to answer that, yeah, please. Question. Sorry, am I unmuted now? Yeah. Yes. And um, it, it's an important question, but the answer, the simple answer is no. There's a lot of differences in different wetlands, in wetlands and themselves, with the, the general ecology and the morphology of the, the shape, the form of the wetland. And there's also a, this, this, a big difference in the socioeconomic structures, the human capital and uh, et cetera, around the wetland, which so therefore what's affected by the uh, disaster. But the basic principles are the same, but the differences occur in the different circumstances. Thank you, Professor Max. And here's another uh, interesting question addressed to all the presenters from Yun, Yunra Raro. Uh, what would you say have been your greatest challenge in, well, challenges in restoring already degraded wetlands? So just um, would like to invite uh, each speaker, maybe based on your experience, which uh, was your greatest challenge in restoring already degraded wetlands. So we'll, let's start with uh, Professor Misaka. Uh, yeah, Professor Misaka, please. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, again, it's an important uh, question. Uh, so um, I'm partly familiar with the uh, restoration of uh, marsh um, wetlands, like marshes, uh, freshwater marshes in Colombo, and then uh, partly like river uh, ecosystem. So I think the first thing is uh, before, like mo most most of the uh, the, co the cause of deg degradation is uh, is either modification or pollution. So the first uh, step should be to remove those stressors as much as possible, whether it's hydrological mod uh, modification, hydrological or hyd hydraulic modification, or influx uh, of uh, pollutants um, into the wetlands before without doing that how much ever you try like of removing uh, invasives or uh, trying to uh, maintain the the hydrologic regime by different methods or replanting uh, it'll come back to the same uh, because uh, you know the the external pressures uh, are there so if, if, if it has moved from the equilibrium, it's natural equilibrium, it's important to remove the, the pressures to bring it, uh, which would enable it to bring it back to the, uh, to the, to the natural equilibrium. It doesn't mean that just by removing the, the, the stressors, you can, it will come back automatically as push might be needed, but, uh, uh, but that is the first step, I think. Um, I will, uh, you know, with that, I'll um, let others speak. And th thank you, uh, Professor Misaka. Uh, uh, Dhruv, on behalf of Dr. Ritesh, um, I mean, like for you, what, what is what's your greatest challenge? Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. And in my experience, I think uh, even acknowledging the wetland was there, or it is a degraded wetland, I think it's, uh, it's a big thing because usually, uh, I think in most part of the, like our country and uh, perhaps in the region, uh, a degraded wetland is considered as a uh, as a wasteland, right? So uh, at least acknowledging that it is a system, it is an ecosystem which can provide a lot of services is I think uh, uh, one of the important things. And I think uh, regarding restoration, uh, having, having the baselines, like up to what extent we want to restore it, up to what extent do we want to reclaim uh, you know, its functions is, uh, I think, one of the biggest challenges, uh, you know, when we go for restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruv. Dr. Anadel, how, how about you? The challenges uh, I face uh, is basically time. It takes time to, to restore or rehabilitate um, a wetland. And uh, so we need it takes time because we have to work with a community also. We have to take time to be able to um, um, 
make them uh, to learn from them as well as to uh, share with them the options that we can take to restore rehabilitate the wetlands and of course the other challenge is the resources the financial resources to commit to this to invest on this long term um, long term actions it cannot be just done overnight yeah, thank you, Dr. Arnadel. Uh, it can be case to case. Uh, and uh, from uh, Professor Max's side, uh, just a quick, uh, you know, like from your, based yeah, on your no, experience. I, that, I think one of the biggest problems we've had to face is how do we control invasive species when you have large populations mm -hmm. of uh, animals or plants which are causing changes, negative changes in the wetland? How do we actually reduce the populations? or get rid of them. It can be very, very difficult. Thank you, Professor Max. Um, maybe we can entertain another question. Uh, actually, it's addressed to you also uh, from uh, Godfrey. Um, based on your experience working uh, with wetlands, how far have countries considered wetlands as part of nature-based solutions in managing disasters. So I think it also applies to other speakers. So the, I mean, based if you if you've worked in other countries as well. So based on your assessment, uh, you think uh, in terms of the uptake, I think um, how countries have. Yeah. Okay. I think it's some countries have been faster than others and some countries are still very, very poor. I don't want to name the countries. I think that's not necessary. But I think we are still seeing some uh, reluctance at the uh, civil society in countries to accept that wetlands are part of the infrastructure. And I think we need to change that. And that's at a local a local government and local management level. So getting, and I think that applies to many countries, even though we are seeing some very good examples as we've heard of um, in these presentations. Yeah, thank you for Professor Max. Um, do you have a, I mean, Dr. Anadel, do you, do you have a reaction as well? Yeah, one of the um, uh, barriers, if you may call it, in uh, using wetlands or, um, or nature-based solutions for disaster risk reduction is the fact that uh, uh, local executives uh, compare it to uh, building a hard infrastructure, for instance, to, uh, yeah. to address flooding, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they build an infrastructure like dikes, uh, uh, concrete dikes, is faster than having um, restoration of uh, mangrove forests or uh, applying uh, adjacent mangrove aquaculture or associated mangrove aquaculture, which will be long term. So that's that's one. A challenge uh, that uh, we have to face or you know why some of the actions are slow. Thank you Dr. Arnidel. Uh, Professor Misaka, do you have uh, like a comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think I, I, I concur with uh, both uh, Prof. Max and uh, um, Arnidel. Yeah. Um, I think one uh, challenge here is uh, I mean rather than thinking what, what percentage of the countries are taking up it uh, also like uh, which sectors of governance uh, are taking it up? Like most of the, the one major barrier to the uptake of of uh, nature-based methods remains that uh, uh, you know you know our traditional planning, uh, design, um, uh, you know disaster uh, management uh, uh, frameworks are all heavily skewed towards uh, hard engineering. Uh, so it's uh, and it comes through not only just by government policy but our education systems, technical training, and so on, and also the standards, uh, the uh, the engineering standards, codes of practice, and so on. So it's it's a, it's a it's a a big process of uh, uh, making changes, making dents in all those sectors, uh, rather than thinking it of as like which countries are doing it um, better and not. Thank you, uh, Dr. Misaka. Um, there's another question here, uh, probably 
I think this can be broken down into two questions. Uh, based on your experience, um, have you involved youth in wetland management for DRR? Or if yes, let's say, how were you able to involve them in uh, uh, wetland management? So for all the speakers again, let's start with uh, Dr. Anadel. Yeah, we have involved uh, the youth uh, in uh, the reforestation of um, uh, and restoration of the Riparian uh, zone in Agusan, and uh, they they come from the adjacent schools, and uh, yeah, they were very eager to participate in uh, this activity. Thank you, Dr. Angel, Professor Max. Hi. It's an area where we actually need to do more. I think we talk about it. Um, a lot of my experience has been with established uh, agency people who are, are more mature, more older, and already in the jobs and are busy and trying to do their jobs. I'm not criticizing that at all. But to go to involve youth, you have an, another part to your job. So it's an important part, but I'm not sure we've been doing it that well. I think it's an area we need to expand. Dr. Misata? Yeah, indeed. Um, so one thing I can say is like, uh, like regardless of how much is uh, happening uh, towards engaging youth in disaster risk reduction or wetlands and disaster risk reduction, uh, I can say for sure that there is a lot of interest. Uh, uh, so uh, because my main engagement, my job is with uh, WWF Environment and Disaster Management uh, uh, program uh, and uh, we last year we conducted uh, a youth program for uh, environment and uh, you know sorry uh, flood risk management uh, nature based flood risk management and that was actually the most well attended uh, the training like we we got so many applications and uh, and engagement and uh, participation so. There's a lot of, uh, it, it's so encouraging. There's a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, among youth uh, on this topic. So um, I think a lot of, including my own organization, like there, uh, there, there are uh, initiatives starting uh, to, uh, to, uh, for youth programs, youth championships, and so on. So, uh, but uh, as, as Professor Max said, a lot needs to be done in that sector. Uh, Dr. Misaka, maybe a drew? Drew, if you want to share quickly. Yeah, uh, I think in my experience, uh, you know, inculcating the ownership uh, amongst youth is very important because often, uh, you know, uh, organizations, they just go and, you know, train them. But basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, developing the ownership, like why wetlands or why systems uh, need to be conserved and what benefit they will get in terms of DRR or in terms of livelihoods. I think that uh, really makes an uh, you know an impact uh, when we talk about wetlands and DRR. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Drew, and to all the speakers. Um, well, good news from uh, the Ramsar Convention uh, side. Um, recently, in uh, COP14 in Geneva, uh, there's a, a resolution on wetland education uh, that has been approved. So uh, this is promoting also wetland education in the formal uh, youth sector. So, and so thank you very much again. And then now to formally conclude the webinar, I would like to invite Dr. Byom Sikyu, Senior Advisor for Asia and Oceania of the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands to deliver the closing remarks. After you, please. Thank, th thank you, Norman. Uh, I'm very honored to be closing on behalf of the Secretary on the Convention of Wetlands. Uh, since we are in the overtime, I'll be very, very brief. But as you can see, the attendance of the webinar, even till this minute, it just shows how interesting and relevant today's topic is. I, I would like to thank many of you who's joining in late hours or early hours to this webinar. Uh, of course, I would like to thank our speakers today, Dr. Max Filayson, uh, Dr. Rishish Kumar, and Dr. Anadel Kabamban for sharing how ECHO-DR is being executed on the ground in India and Philippines. And also I'd like to thank Misaka. I'm not going to even try to 
pronounce your last name for uh, for introducing the guidance publication, which we are launching uh, through today's webinar. Uh, let me thank UNEP and the PETA program for partnering with the Secretary to follow up on the resolution 1213 that we talked about on wetlands and DOR, explore how parties, communities, and wetland managers can better uptake ECHO DOR. As, um, as Ms. Marisol Estrella has pointed out, this has been a culmination of many years' work. Uh, I would like to thank Masaka for leading the publication of this report. I would like to thank and congratulate our partners, Ramsar Regional Center East Asia, the Wetlands International uh, South Asia, and UNEF Peru team for the collaboration on this publication. As um, today's webinar has pointed out, wetlands provide protection against many natural disasters, especially water-related disasters, which account for 90% of all global disasters. With the changing climate, wetlands are undoubtedly important nature-based solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And I would like to remind the Ramsar sites, which today we have 2,471 sites around the world, have a total surface of 256 million hectares of land, which is about the landmass of Argentina. So we know that this will continue to play a critical role and provide, among many benefits, resilience to natural disasters. However, as today's speakers have pointed out, this is not as straightforward as we would like it to be. In order to fully realize the full potential of wetlands in Echo DOR, those who manage these sites need to understand the system and plan better, a plan that not only aims to respond to different natural disasters when it happens, but a plan that continues to protect the ecosystem service of wetlands that make wetlands so effective against natural disasters, and which, which is pretty much promoting wise use of wetlands. For this reason, I believe this guide to wetland managers are timely and important work applicable uh, to many insight managers around the world. Once again, I'd like to thank our speakers for the insightful presentations. Congratulations to Masaka and our partners for the launching of the publication. And thank you all for joining today's seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, and uh, just a reminder to please download the, the guidebook through uh, the link that provided in the, in the chat box. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar. We hope that you have gained more knowledge from this event with regard to wetlands and DRR. So with that, we wish you a pleasant day for or night to <laughs> yeah, thank you again. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you and goodbye. Good morning, everyone.